I'm going to toss it over to Lou to begin his uh, bug ID presentation. Right. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Alan. And thanks, FMC, for uh, having me speak again. Uh, the reason I used bug in quotes is because, as you can see from various pictures I have on this first slide, shows a, uh, many of the arthropods are simply called bugs for some reason. And, um, and as you all know, of course, bugs are a certain type of insect with uh, piercing sucking mouth parts. Um, arthropod means jointed foot or jointed leg, just so you're aware. And that's why all these creatures are really included in arthropods as among other body parts too. All right, let's see here. This. Okay, and here's a diagram showing some of the common arthropods, some um, as fossils, as trilobites are, and the crustaceans I'm going to hit on just a bit because we'll have ice, amphipods and isopods that sometimes people find, and the uh, horseshoe crabs uh, I, I didn't cover, but uh, I'll just show you a picture here. And the uh, rest of the creatures will be arachnids, myriapods, which are the millipede centipedes, and the um, arachnids, uh, commonly known as um, spiders, scorpions, uh, harvestmen kind of creatures, and plus some others you probably never might see, but it's nice to know what these can be and look like. Uh, here's a, a general diagram showing the uh, percentages of what types of creatures I'm covering and the numbers by which they um, occur in nature. You can see spiders are a pretty large number, uh, flies, beetles, and the various hymenops, hymenoptera uh, are many species. Uh, the first thing to go over are amphipods, just to show because uh, sometimes uh, people that say in Florida will find these in the home or in the lawn. Uh, they're known as lawn shrimp, uh, sand shrimp, some other names. Uh, these are flattened, bilaterally symmetrical and laterally flattened like fleas that are laterally flattened. The uh, body actually has no carapace in amphipods. And the word amphipod means multiple feet, multiple legs. And the reason being that the rear section legs are leg-like, but the front section are different. So those front legs are different from the rear. Uh, and if you have come across these, the ones that are brownish red, of course, are dead ones. Uh, isopods, these are the wood lice that you might come across. You can see some come in many um, colors or just boring gray. Um, the ones like this one in, in C is like, is an armadillidium. That one has no rear extensions like this species has here. And the armadillidium are able to curl up as is shown in this figure down below. All their legs are very much the same. There's no modification to the front ones. Um, you have an aquatic isopod up in the top right, and you have parasitic isopods uh, in the center. These would be on uh, gills and uh, some areas on fish. And here's an aquatic benthic isopod. So this occurs in the ocean and it um, occurs in the deep ocean. And as in other isopods, they're basically uh, detritivores and um, feeding on with this kite, uh, this species here, uh, whales that have died and now are on the ocean floor. The diplopods are the millipedes. Uh, they basically have, except for the front few segments of their body, they have two pair of legs per body segment. The uh, first instars being on the left, and as they grow, they add segments. They're not um, venomous, as some people might make mistakes on that. The centipedes are the ones I'll cover in a minute. Those are venom, uh, but the 
millipedes actually have a lot of chemistry involved and they can produce various chemicals to repel and ward off predators. Some cyanides, hydroquinones, things like that. Uh, there are some predaceous centipedes, but basically they're feeding on uh, maybe dead animals and plants and also uh, rotting plants. And you can see not all are tubular, some are actually flat. The uh, mating structures of the male occur in the front fourth or so segment of the body. Uh, and uh, that's the reason for the, the non two segmented, uh, sorry, non uh, two pair of, of uh, leg segments in the beginning segments of the body. And they also have antenna for sensing their environment. The centipedes basically have one pair of legs per body segment. They have antenna and the female does have maternal behavior in many of the scolopendrid species and wrap around the eggs that she incubates and keeps and the young stay with her for a bit. Some of them have very long bodies and uh, many segments and some just have shorter bodies. The uh, front end of this scolopendrid these are the toxicognath or forcipules. These are modified front legs of the centipede and these inject venom. The venom is not injected by the mouth parts. Mouth parts in here are a chewing type of mouth part. Some have eyes, some don't have eyes. As with the millipedes, which I forgot to cover and tell you, some have eyes, some are blind. The house centipede is one centipede that actually has compound eyes, which are not the same exactly as what insect compound eyes are, but they still are compound. And the uh, spiracles for breathing are actually in the dorsum of the body of this animal. You can see the um, front legs here are modified to inject venom. Now we're into arachnids. These are the order scorpions. Uh, the uh, female scorpion uh, has um, the young inside her body, and when they're born, they climb up on her back, and she buses them around for at least one or maybe two instars, usually two instars. Uh, scorpions have the abdomen of a scorpion is uh, actually in two parts. It's the front section which is mesosoma, and the last five segments is a metasoma. So it's not really a true tail. The tail of the scorpion actually is the stinger itself, because that's at the, after the anus and the last segment of the body. These are the whip scorpions, which even though, of course, it has its name scorpion, it's not a scorpion at all. It's a different arachnid order. You can see the uh, pedipalps on it, unlike a scorpion, are not pincher-like, um, and chelate, which means um, claw-like. The uh, whip at the rear end is a, a sensory structure, and the female carries her egg mass under her body, and when they're born, they also climb up on her back. In this order, Thelophonids, uh, these also are known, of course, as vinegaroons, the uh, front legs are modified to antenniform organs. So they're used for sensing, even though they're a front pair of legs. And the amblypigids, another order, these are called whip spiders or tailless whip scorpions, not scorpions, not spiders. Uh, they have the pedipalps for grasping and they're pincher-like um, for, not, sorry, not pincher-like. They're for grasping, they're more elongate than the uh, thelophonids or the vinegaroons have. And they too have their front legs modified as antenniform organs. Uh, both of these groups uh, don't have very good eyesight and a lot of their activity is at night. And that way these creatures can stay in one spot and simply move their front legs around to touch the environment. They hit a, pre a, a prey item, I'll go over and grab it and they chew up their prey 
they have their calliciferae, which are in the front. Uh, these are pincher-like, and they tear out prey, just like the um, scorpions. They have a little pincher-like calliciferae, and um, the uh, whip scorpions, they, they have pincher-like calliciferae. The, the uh, female carries her eggs in the amblypigids uh, under the body, and the young climb up on her back and stay with her through about two molts. And I have the young one that's molted twice, and that's the size, and that's what it started in, as the first instar on her back. Solifuges, these are another order of arachnid. You can see the enormous calicery of this order. It's very diagnostic for the group. They typically have only two eyes. And the pedipalps, which in the other preceding groups uh, were either uh, chelate for grasping or pinching. Uh, these are simply leg-like, and they're good sensory structures too. And they also will use them to grasp uh, soil that they'll dig through the soil and push it and carry it to carve out a burrow. And pseudoscorpions, another group of arachnids, uh, have the pedipalps pincher-like for like a scorpion for grasping. And they also can practice foracy, which is hitching a ride on some other creature. So they'll go on beetles and flies and bugs like this uh, red of on the left. They'll hold on and be carried from one place to another. Uh, they also, as in the other preceding orders, uh, carry their young, the eggs, and sometimes under their abdomen, or they might produce a brood chamber and keep them in there. Oh, and sorry, with these solifuges, they produce uh, eggs. They don't carry them on their bodies. They keep them in a, a chamber underground where they're living. Now, pileonids or pileones, this is another order of arachnids. Uh, it looks like one body part. They're sort of fused. It's the only um, arachnid group that has direct sperm transfer through a penis from the male to the female. All the others are indirect where they produce a spermatophore and place it where the female gets it and then takes it to inseminate herself. You can see that these arachnids have various body shapes from two round globular things to spiny. Uh, the pedipalps are for grasping their prey. They're in the front. Typically there are two eyes on a little mound here and here on the head, on the front part, the carapace. And uh, you can see sometimes these pedipalps are for grasping, like I explained, and they're pincher-like. Here's a ricinulid called a hooded tick spider. Uh, it's not a tick and it's not a spider. It's the other group of arachnids. The larva is six-legged as you, you know it, well, as you will know, in mites, the larval stage is a six-legged creature, the nymph and adult being eight-legged. And the neat thing about ricinulids is the front cuculus, this little hinged cover plate that opens up and the calicery, the mouth parts are inside. The other interesting part about these animals is the male has modified third leg tarsi for transferring sperm. And in the whole group, the pedipalps are the small leg-like structures that are ventrally placed on the body, as you could sort of see in this picture here and in this one here. Many of these are leaf litter and cave-dwelling creatures. And now mites, another group, some are parasitic, like in the mites here on the harvestman. Uh, some are uh, phoretic, and I'll have a picture of that later. Some are predaceous. Some are um, plant feeding, stored food product feeding. Um, the uh, larval stage of mites and ticks are six-legged. The nymph and adult are eight-legged. Uh, you can see the uh, Cantharid, be the uh, Lampyrid beetle here has a lot of mites under the wing covers or elytra, and then the sulfid beetle. The uh, 
mites are all over it, they're being carried uh, when the sylphid beetle, which is typically on carrion, um, goes from one place to another, it's able to bring the mites along. And this helicted bee has an acararium on its abdomen in which the mites stay and they're carried from, and it's a solitary bee. It uh, goes to its uh, nest area in the ground and um, carries mites from one place to another cell, to another cell that way. And these are also phoretic uh, on this fly. And this uh, pyamodid mites, these can be on insects and on uh, stored product pests too, and they will bite people. You can see the enlarged abdomen of the female here. And these are mites. Um, just put this in because a lot of times, this time of year, a lot of red mites show up crawling about. And I just wanted to point out that a clover mite, Bryobia, is the mite on the left side here. Uh, many times, a lot of these other red mites have been on Facebook and on some of the pest related sites calling all these things um, clover mites when in fact they're not. Uh, this is an aphid, this is an insect, just to show you the sort of similar body shape uh, to uh, mites, and sometimes they're misidentified as mites. Sometimes some of the mites are misidentified as aphids. But uh, six legged larvae and eight legged nymphs and adults. Sometimes the immature stage of mites can be parasitic, and then the adult nymphs and adults are predaceous, sometimes on insect eggs, mite eggs, or insects and mites and other small arthropods. Uh, just to show you another kind of arthropod, another arachnid, this is a palpigrade. It's a minute sort of leaf litter to actually cave dwelling. And schizomids are a type of micro um, whip scorpion, I think is a common name. The front legs also are modified for uh, sensory structure, antenna form, and the pedipalps are elongate, but for grasping. Uh, now spiders, this is a Distera crocata. This is the isopod feeding spider. Um, it, it's not specifically only a spider that feeds on isopods, but it will go after spiders and some other creatures as well. Uh, the distinctive part about this, which you may see if, if you get a specimen of it, are the elongate calyceri that stick out in front and the large fangs and the eyes, there are six eyes in a little group here. And you'll notice on the carapace, there's really no cervical groove. So that's very different from a lot of the other spiders you'll come across, you'll see a, a mark in there, but it's not really existent on these spiders for some reason. And just other spiders, we have falsed spiders. You can see the male spider has modified pedipalps for transferring sperm. Uh, widow spiders, other theridaeid spiders, a mimetid spider. This one feeds on other spiders, and it actually has modified uh, CD of a large CD and intermixed with small CD gra for grasping on the front legs. Uh, Araneid spiders, oxyopid spiders, tetragnathid spiders. Uh, the, you're familiar with probably some of these, and these uh, oxyopid or lynx spiders are the top right and this bottom right here. Uh, other araneids, these are um, spiny bodied kind of hard bodied spiders. Uh, dinopid spiders, you can see the enlarged uh, eyes. These are posterior median eyes, and I'll show you. Uh, Jumping spiders, it's actually the anterior median eyes, which are enlarged. And on this spider, the anterior median eyes are, are below the uh, large posterior medians. And on the, which it doesn't show here, here it is. These are the anterior lateral eyes on the outside edge. Uh, this spider produces a net 
and it has pre-focused eyes for and good night vision because it'll stay upside down and toss a net down. It's also a cribolate spider, which means it produces a cribolate silk, which is a specialized structure at the front part of its spinnerets and a comb on the hind leg for pulling out the specialized silk, which is kind of uh, frothy looking. And it's good for grasping prey, even though there's no glue on it. Uh, wolf spiders, crab spiders, naphosid spiders, agilented spiders. Uh, you can see this wolf is a distinctive female carrying young on her back. She'd also carry her egg sac on her spinnerets. And the eye arrangement is distinctive, I'll show. And here are the jumping spiders where the large eyes, the anterior and median eyes are enlarged on jumping spiders. And they're very different from all the other six eyes because they're able to focus and move the retina inside this eye in order to focus. And sometimes if you look at them, you'll see fluttering going on in the eye. That's because they're trying to focus on you. There's many of the ant mimicking jumping spiders here. Uh, the wolf spiders, to show just the eye arrangement and what eyes are there for any identification you have to do. And an Agilinopsis spider, you can see the eyes there. They're different, of course, in arrangement from the wolf spiders and from the jumping spiders. A Sicariid spider, this is where the Loxoceles or recluse spider are now classified in this family. Um, these are the sand spiders in that the uh, spiders in sand will simply toss their legs over their backs, pushing sand over them and cover themselves up. Uh, this is a uh, picture in the center of a uh, Loxicelles recluse spider and showing you some of the other spiders that are often misidentified as being a recluse spider. The distinct the parts, of course, uh, to be able to identify these spiders are the th three dyads of eyes on Loxoceles and the distinctive palp on a mature male, because in spiders, the modified uh, the male has a modified palp for transferring sperm. And you could see it's a very simple arrangement in this particular spider. Um, a tarantula, these are atherophosid spiders. Uh, you can see that this is a second instar tarantula spiderling. The uh, first instars came out of the egg and these are the shed skins. Uh, you can see that also the young don't really look like the adult female at this point in their life. Now insects, these are mayflies and the uh, immature stages are aquatic and have the uh, gills on on their abdomen, as you could see a few here. The uh, in, the uh, these are the hemimetabolous insects in that they have nymph stages after the egg stage, which resemble sort of the adult stage. There's no pupil stage as would be in holometabolous insects, which are other insects I'll cover later. And with this group of mayflies, they actually have a subimago and an imago stage. So from the nymph stage or naiad, which is the name given to aquatic nymphs, which occurs in uh, different insects too, uh, you have a molt, uh, a stage from that last instar nymph going to a subimago stage. And then that molts, because it's a wing stage, to the final adult stage. Right, very soon after. And the odinates, uh, these are the mayfly, the uh, sorry, damselflies and dragonflies. And you see the immature naiad stage. And these creatures has an, a uh, labium, which is a mouth part, which is toothed for grasping prey. And it's been modified and enlarged under the head and has. Um, recurved teeth on it for the most part for extending quickly out forward to grasp prey and bring it back. The uh, adult male and female in dragonflies, the male has grasping structures at the rear end of his body. He grasps the neck of the female 
and she then curves her abdomen forward in order to go and get the sperm from a secondary area underneath the body of the male. It's a little involved, but it works. And here, a different group of insects now, and they, they're still hemming metabolists, are stoneflies. And the uh, gills of stoneflies are in the thorax of the animal. And the immature stage is the aquatic stage, so these are naiads also. And you can see the gills in this particular uh, stonefly uh, naiad. And you can also see in the bottom right, a late instar uh, naiad and the wing buds are, are visible on that. Into Orthoptera, these are crickets, uh, various crickets, uh, just to show you the variability in various uh, cricket species. And a mole cricket, which modified front legs for digging, and Katie did. The uh, camel crickets that you most likely will find indoors. Uh, the female has an elongate blade-shaped ovipositor. The male, of course, being a male, doesn't. And the uh, crickets that are commonly used in the pet trade is Akita, just to show you a male and a female. And Brilodes, uh is another genus of cricket that's used in the pet trade. Uh, I'll also into the uh, Blattodia, which I'll cover the uh, pest species of cockroaches later, but just to show you that here are some labrid cockroaches. Uh, the, uh, I've seen some information about the female um, of, of this group of cockroaches where they said they abort the egg case if something bothers them, when in fact, they're not really aborting it. They produce an egg case, the oothica, they extend it out from their body and then pull it back to a brood chamber. And the young are brooded inside as an ovoviviparous cockroach species. In the same order as the cockroaches in that order, Blattodia are also termites. And termites have a caste system. As, as you all know, uh, you have an egg. The first instar out of the egg is called a larva. Although it's not a holometabolous insect, this is also a hemimetabolous insect. And the uh, insects can be um, soldiers or workers. They may become secondary reproductives. They may go into being primary reproductives. It depends what that, that nest really needs. And the queen is then moderating what goes on by her pheromone produce. The caste system, you could see here an allate, which is the reproductive stage, and the uh, termite um, with wings. So this one's uh, going to be a reproductive. Then you have workers and you have soldiers. And in this group, you have um, young produced, of course, by the female, and she'll live 20 years or more. And so she's producing lots and lots of eggs, millions of eggs, and the workers in there take care of them. Um, you see how physogastric the body becomes too. And you'll see swarms. This is various species of the allates, the wing reproductives and deallates when the wings break off. There are also stubs on the body where the break off occurs. And these are the Mbioptera web spinners. Sometimes they're misidentified as allate termites and deallate termites if the wings are off but they have modified front tarsi for, for to, to produce silk. And that's why they're called web spinners. They live inside silk and tubes and the wings are hinged in that they can go backward and forward and their wings will switch back and forth as they're moving through there. This is uh, just to show you some of, uh, of a similarity between one kind of neuropter and a mantispid fly and the true mantid having um, the raptorial front legs uh, and um, a, a species of orchid mantid where the adult, the sorry, the common name orchid really comes from the nymph stages that are pinkish colored, but the adult male and female in different lighting conditions. And um, what happens, this male will drum on her back, you think to 
get her attention, but I've seen him drum and she ignores him. So I'm not sure how mating occurs. Uh, Hemiptera, these are the true bugs with a modified beak for um, in, um, putting stylus into the prey item or their host or plant and taking fluids out. These are the aquatic uh, hemipterans here, gerids and um, water scorpion. And this is another hemipteran, uh, a back swimmer, and other a water boatman, which is actually algae feeding in this creature and not predaceous. Or, uh, these are the bellastomatids, where many certain species, the uh, female lays eggs on the back of the male. And these will hurt if they do bite you. Some are called electric light insects. They'll attract it to light. You might find them in a pool sometimes too. These are some true bugs. Uh, show you the nymph stages and um, adult stages. And uh, common leptoglossus people usually find in the fall and they start becoming active and fly about in the spring. Or if they're in your house or in your uh, customer's house, uh, they might be get warm enough in the winter time, so they'll be out and and find their way into the living portion of the house too. And some um, nymphs, eggs, nymphs of a particular uh, stink bug here, a common brown marmorated stink bug here that you might find. And these are the burrowing bugs, cydnids. Um, just showing you uh, the nymph stages and adult stages. And uh, Redivid is a masked hunter where the nymph is covered in dust. And a wheel bug, just showing you some of the nymph stages and adults here. And a Redivid, this is one of the um, blood feeding, which try to mine uh, Redivids, which can transfer um, trypanosomes if they're infected. And it's not through the, the mouth parts, it's actually by defecating on the, the host, on the person. And then that gets scratched into the wound. And a uh, ambush bug, another redivid now, and feeding on a bee. Uh, mirrored bugs, some of these are ant mimics, and they're pretty good mimics. You have to look at morphology in order to identify creatures, not their overall similarity to something. So it's important to know what you're looking for, what body parts look for. Here in aphid, you see the cornicles, which are the black tube-like structures at the rear end of this particular aphid, and it's giving birth, uh, live birth to a nymph, first instar nymph. And a cactus, these are the um, uh, cochineal bugs where the red color comes from, carmine. And a uh, white flies, these are more bugs, true bugs, and cicada, which is molting, the nymph is molting, giving rise to an adult. And one of those adults caught by this cicada killer wasp. And this is a male cicada, so it might be possible that that wasp was cueing in on the sound that male produces to attract females. And this is a periodical cicada that has a body full of a a uh, fungus that is associated with those 17 and 13 year cicadas. Uh, book lice, you might have come across. They have an enlarged um, clypeus. It's very distinctive once you know what to look for, plus a thread like antenna. And Neuroptera, Megaloptera, the Dobson flies, and the Neuroptera, the nerve wing insect, lace wing type creatures. And this is a larval lace wing. These are now the holometabolous insects where you have uh, uh, egg larval stages, which are different looking from the adult. You have a pupil stage where that change from immature to adult occurs. These are owl flies. They have a knobbed antenna. They're now included with the ant lions. And here are some of the owl fly larvae. They're predaceous larvae, of course. And, uh, and the uh, ant lions. So these are the larval stages. You see how modified the uh, mandible maxilla system is on these. And these are taking in um, inject 
well, I don't, they don't inject any venom or anything, but they're just grasping. These are living, of course, in the sand funnels where they throw sand up at ants that are crawling over and the ants lose their footing and gets fall down to the bottom of the funnel where that animal then grabs them. And here we saw some before, these are some of the mantispids. So the look like mantids, but are not related whatsoever. Some are living in wasp nests, uh, paper wasps, and uh, some are free living. Some are on spiders in their egg cases. These are Strepsiptera, the twisted wing parasites. The red arrows pointing to their front wings, which are similar to beetles in that the modified front wings of beetles are the elytra. And these are parasitic creatures where they uh, live in this particular species uh, in the abdomen of a uh, paper wasps. The uh, female is grub-like and stays there. The male is one that's winged and he'll go fly at uh, flowers where the wasps might be and then he can go mate with the female that's inside there. And this is a picture of some of the uh, larval stage and pupil stage of these particular creatures. They have modified antenna, which are very distinctive. And scorpion flies, which have modified heads. The male, they're called scorpion flies because in the male, you'll see the abdomen looks like a curved up tail of, of a rear end of a scorpion. Uh, and snow scorpion flies here. And sort of a tapulid looking, crane fly looking scorpion fly here. and beetles. So you see the variability of various beetles, front wings modified. This is one species of that pest, um, ladybird beetle, the Asian ladybird beetle. You can see it's polymorphic. It actually comes in all these colors. So you might find one and think you have a different species when in fact, no, you have this one species just is, is polymorphic. So- Hey Lou, just a more, quick reminder. Yeah. Just before you, before you, uh, Burge on, you've got like about 10, 11 minutes. Oh, I know. Yeah, go I'm going to, the... I was looking at the clock. You know. Now I know okay. I'm going to run through <laughs> more of these faster. Just to show you various okay. kinds of beetles, uh, dermestid beetles here with the larvae feeding on carrion. Uh, we have what were called seed weevils, are not really weevils. These are chrysomelid beetles, actually. And you can see these very much enlarged hind femora. Uh, these are different fly species to show you variation in flies with the uh, mosquitoes in this particular slide, different three genera here. The larval mosquitoes and pupal mosquitoes, very distinctive in their typical siphon for getting air uh, from out of the water surface if these are the ones that are living, pre-living in water. And so some more of those pictures uh, Toxorynchites, a non-blood feeding mosquito, although it's used in some movies, um, but it actually has this curved proboscis and it doesn't feed on blood. Male, fe the female doesn't feed on blood. They're just nectar and liquid feeders. A Tychopterid, one of the black and white crane flies, a different family from the tapulids and other crane flies. And some more crane flies here, just to show you some variation, their mouth parts. They have mouth parts, but some don't feed. These are wingless crane flies in different families. Uh, this, these are chaobrid midges, not culicid, not mosquitoes. Um, and the larvae of these are actually predaceous on mosquito larvae. These are moth flies. Uh, people also call them um, a name I hardly ever use, <laughs> drain flies, but um, I, I like moth fly because they look like little moths, actually. And uh, they, of course, they live in drains and toilets. There are some of the elongate larvae were living here in a toilet that wasn't used much, but enough to have organic material in it. And here are some of the pictures and some where they were living in a, in a, a business, in the floor, in the drain. And Drosophila, these are the fruit flies, what we call fruit flies. Um, pumice flies, vinegar flies, just showing you different species of the red eyed one, plus the dark eyed fruit flies, which act a lot like those moth flies in the larval stage in organic material, and also in forward flies, humpback flies, 
um, their larval stage being in, in organic, wet organic material too, in drains and some other places. And here are some different forages to show you the wing venation and the eyes and the um, antenna, which have a very, if you can see it, a very elongated arista and the typical second segment of the antenna is rounder and globular. Uh, this is showing you larvae and pupae comparing forward flies and drosophilid flies that you may find in the same, like I said, in the same situation, but there are different species and different fly families, very different. Scatopsid flies, these are in um, organic material, a very distinctive like black uh, dark winged fungus gnats, except their antennae are very chubby and heavy, so they're easier to identify. Uh, help you identify if you find these and not call them cyarid flies. Uh, horse flies and deer flies, many of these being blood feeding uh, the female and um, eggs and uh, larva and pupa of a deer fly. Uh, pigeon fly, this is a hippobosid fly. Uh, sometimes these will bite people. They'll be in the nest area of the pigeons and fly in the windows. And I had this happen in one case. Uh, different view of the pigeon fly. Uh, deer cad, this is another fly. Uh, it's parasitic on deer and it doesn't have wings. It stays on that animal. Butterflies and moths to show you some variability in butterflies and moths. Not all butterflies are butterflies. This is a day flying moth in Madagascar. And these are Manduca sexta caterpillars that I reared and just showing you the different colored food I've given them. Uh, things that have yellow in it, blues and orange have yellow. So these creatures turn green. And of course you don't see them normally blue if they're on your plants outdoors uh, because they're feeding on green plants. There's yellow in the green and that's how they turn green. I cooked some after and uh, the non color, they'll use the color that's not used by them is sequestered in their fat body, the blue and the red, red being from orange. And pupil stage, as they first uh, pupate, the proboscis is short and as it matures, the proboscis elongates. Um, ants, these are uh, different species of ants, just showing you allate ants, the reproductive stage having wings and compared these to termite allates. These are vespid wasps. These are the Polistes paper wasp, different species. This was just online uh, that Brent showed and it's actually an old uh, paper wasp nest. These two bees, megachylid leaf cutter bees, and maybe more of them have used the abandoned cells in order to use those cells to put their eggs in and the cut leaves in. And this other Polistes wasp said, oh, this is great too. And she started a new founding uh, queen. She founded and started a new nest on that substrate. Uh, these are black and yellow, yellow jackets. These are black and white yellow jackets. The, uh, what we call a bald face hornet isn't really a hornet, but it's a, uh, a true hornet. It's a black and white yellow jacket. And these are large uh, Vespa mandarinia. These are true hornets and they were cooked uh, and they were in this uh, liquid, which is the, um, a, I had this when I was at a meeting in the Netherlands. It tastes like uh, dead wasps, but it was kind of tasty actually, called soshu, shochu. Uh, Avenid wasp, if you find these, you know you have, these are parasites of paraplanita and blatta egg cases, so you know you have a cockroach problem. These are minute wasps. These can be less than a millimeter long. These are ant artifact in a forensic case where the ants have actually chewed areas and taken larvae from the uh, uh, corpses. And this is a little review of glue board captures. You can read that. I don't have to repeat it. These are some Drosophila. These were rodent baits infested by flies, the wet area. 
or Drosophila bleeding, breeding sites of dark-eyed Drosophila. You could see them here. This is a picture I sort of used before with another unknown, but these were Drosophila there. And forward flies, this we saw already just to show you and illustrate Drosophila and forward fly pupa, and some locations where these were uh, collected from. And uh, forensic cases uh, showing the uh, light colored pupa is just recently in, uh, produced from that the last larval stage. And the larval stage, actually the skin hardens. These are puparia. The, uh, in these flies, the pupa is within the last larval skin, a third larval skin of the maggot. So here is just some of the domiciliary cockroaches, the uh, pest species that I said I'd you know look at uh, a little later, just showing you some of the species that you probably have come across. This was also posted, and some misidentified as being fly pupa or fly puparia, uh, but th these are definitely the Otheca of brown banded cockroaches. And here's a few species of non of some pests and some outdoor species. These are zygentoma, these are the silverfish, cockroaches and silverfish stuck on a glue board. Uh, these are small Rizopertha dominica, small bostricid beetles in that food item. Uh, these were silk in here, a little bit, uh, not much really. And these were trogoderma larvae uh, inside that food item and they bored their way out of the cardboard. And nuts, these were beetles in nuts. These were sylvanid beetles. This is a way to tell the uh, Orizophila serenimensis from Orizophila mercator. And these are tenebrionid beetles. The one just recently it closed, so it's pale colored. It has to darken over time. And this is Alphtobius infestation, one of the tenebrionid beetles on where uh, pigeons nested and they were feeding on that. They'll, they'll also skeletonize uh, carrion, similarly to the way dermestids do that. And these are some different species of the uh, tribolium species you might come across. Lemophilids and sylvanid beetles you may come across. And the spider beetle, very common Gibium equinoctiali uh, under Infrared lighting, you can see its smooth body actually is uh, has some structure to it. And some other mesium species and Lasioderma cigarette beetles uh, compared to drugstore beetles. So you can see the structures for identifying them and the ventral view of a few different beetles to show you that extension of the first abdominal segment between the legs. It's, if you come across just abdomens, you can say, well, it's not a bed bug because I've getting a lot of these abdomens of beetles, people thinking they're bed bugs. I might just quickly run through some of these other slides and then we can have questions at the end. So I'll quickly run through these too. Uh, just, yeah, because we got like a, a minute got a left. Short time. Yeah, and these can... are um, yeah. beetles compared to uh, what people think are bed bugs and odd beetle which is one of the um, uh, dermestid beetles, the uh, female there uh, often is misidentified as being a bed bug nymph, but it isn't. And you can see the comparison here in this slide of what the structures really look like. And other dermestids, a parthenogenetic dermestid, only females in the population. Carpet beetle, exuvia, forward fly pupae, um, carpet beetle larvae, the anthronous beetles here, uh, what people find a lot, the uh, larval beetles feeding on carrion and other items. Also, uh, if you have anticoagulant baits or just some stuck, you know, in a trap, they'll be hit either by tineid moths, the closed moths, and also uh, dermestid beetles. Sometimes Black carpet beetles are pretty common to find, as in what it is here. And some with the Hastacidae, these can cause a dermatitis on particular uh, beetle larvae, 
the anthrenous beetles especially, maybe Trogoderma too, as you see here. These are Dermestes. These are Dermestes that are bored into a book in order to pupate. And more Dermestid beetles. These are Latridiid beetles that people think maybe uh, when you find them, they're very small. They're actually mold and moisture associated, not so much uh, stored food product beetles. So they're very distinctive looking. And a moth infestation. Uh, this is a Plodium moth, the uh, Indian meal moth. And the moth infestation in nuts, you can see the droppings, pupa, larvae. And here, tineid moths, the closed moths, uh, the larvae of which had been feeding on skins and taxidermy mounts. They've come across and also hit the uh, rat carcasses, mouse carcasses, and a uh, beetle issue in um, these were in vaults, actually. The way the uh, insects were misidentified as being flies, and uh, they were looking in potted plants when, in fact, they went in and all the vaults in different vaults in different places, from Jules to um, down to World Trade Center you know, a long time ago. These micromalthid beetles were there, and they're very distinctive beetles. They have a very interesting life cycle. Uh, can be either through a larval stage, through a pedogenic larva, which is a female, and or go through a male and female stage. And then these were written up in the New York Times back in 1994 as finding them on Wall Street, which was one place we did find them. Uh, hey, uh, uh, Lewis, let's jump to the quiz here. Okay. Because we are, our time has elapsed. Um, oh, I do have one right. quick question though, and then Ed will get to the question to the quiz. But how much nectar do female mosquitoes consume? Oh, I don't know the actual amount of nectar, but um, they need it for their own sustenance and energy. So they're whatever they need, they're they're taking as do the males. It's hard to say. Uh, I'm not sure of the actual amounts. That that was a good question. All right, before we get to the quiz, thank you, Lou. Really appreciate it. And um, before I hand it over to uh, hand it over to Ed for the quiz, um, thank you everyone for joining the call here. Great information from Lou. And then just as a reminder, in our for our first Friday in June, uh, we're going to have a presentation on treatment tactics for termites by Christian Wilcox, who is an associate entomologist or like certified entomologist from from Macaulay Services, who he is the technical director at. He's over in Arkansas. And then also in the afternoon, we'll have developing insect management programs for turf grass that will be presented by Dr. Richard, I'm sorry, Dr. Douglas Richmond, who is a professor of entomology at Purdue University. So that'll be the first Friday uh, webinar uh, series uh, in, uh, in June next month. So with that, Ed, I'll turn it over to you for the quiz. Oh, yeah, I just say one thing, which might be on the quiz, uh, has to do with uh, non-parasitic, non-biting bugs may bite you even though they're plant feeding bugs or predaceous bugs. It's very possible. Okay.